If you were the last line of defense against a graboid invasion of Asia, what would you do? Imagine a billionaire moved in next door to you and opened a free-range tiger hunting park for other rich idiots. Now, imagine instead of tigers, it's a subterranean species of man-eating monsters that evolve like a Pokemon into a Velociraptor and eventually into a Pterodactyl. Sounds awesome, unless you're on the menu. I'm going to break down the mistakes made by the hunters and research team, try to make better decisions and ultimately attempt to beat the Shriekers in Tremors, Shrieker Island. These hunters are about to become the hunted. In a tide jungle, a kid parkours his way to a clearing where a group of American big game hunters lie in wait. As he steps into view, they aim their guns and activate special poison dart ammo. Something roars into the clearing after the kid. A massive graboid breaks the surface of the earth like a breaching megalodon and the hunters open fire with heavy artillery. When the hunt ends empty-handed, Bill assures the group that they'll bag their trophy tomorrow. His second-in-command, Anna, doesn't want to continue the hunt. She warns Bill that this isn't like their other jobs. The predators that they've come to hunt on this island were genetically modified. At least when they were hunting lions and bears, they met on an even playing field. Bill's too blinded by pride and adrenaline to back down, though. Thanks to Bloodline Heroes of Lithus for sponsoring this video. Bloodline Heroes of Lithus is a card-based fantasy RPG mobile game that's free to play on both Android and iOS. Begin by choosing which champion vessel you'll inject your soul into, then immediately assume the throne. Now, at the forefront of your concerns is to start attacking the evil hordes outside Lithus' walls. As a successful military commander with a newfound threat to justify your existence, you can begin your using your pull in the Senate to aid the city, manage districts, tax citizens, and partake in gladiatorial arena games to distract said citizens from their woes. It's lonely at the top, especially when you got there simply by logging in. Among your kingly duties of waging wars is procreating your successors. One way to court companions is also simply by logging in. All you have to do is just walk up and say hi, guys. It's that easy. Or if you're a metaphor orc, you can complete harrowing missions to show your prowess, or brainwash prisoners of war. Courting isn't just about taking your crushed mini-golf guys. After some flowers, and hopefully not red wedding, and some curtains drawing, a baby appears with a unique combination of both of your abilities. Raise your baby champion to be a merchant, politician, or warrior who will transcend your legacy by marrying strong champions and infusing their abilities. Download the game now by clicking my link in the description, or or by scanning my QR code. Use my gift code BLDHOL1 in the description to get one champion token, 100,000 gold, and 100 diamonds. This hunt is doomed, and not just because they brought bows and arrows and pea shooters to a monster hunt. At this point in the lore of Graboids, the entire world knows of their existence. They're well-documented animals with known biology and life cycles. Teams of people have had dangerous encounters with them before, and better hunters than Bill have tried to use guns and barely survived. Back in Nevada, Val Earl and the residents of Perfection learn to stay off the ground and eventually take shelter on the giant boulders to keep out of the Graboid's reach. You may be saying, sure, but those were local yokels and these are big game hunters. Now I would tell you, exactly. Why are Bill and his crew messing this up worse than a bunch of unarmed civilians playing the floor as lava in the Nevada desert? If Bill and his hunters actually want to kill anything this century, they should be up off the ground in treehouse based or on elevated watchtowers, like Ewoks. And they should all be packing better weaponry than this. I count hunting rifles, elephant guns, and, well, a minigun. The rifles and elephant guns would be great against a terrestrial predator, but they're barely better than worthless against a subterranean ambush predator with armored skin protected by compacted earth. Only rapid, consistent, penetrating rounds are going to kill this thing, so bolt-action rifles are not going to cut it. For a graboid, they would be better off going for an M8 2A a 50 BMG that was built to shoot at helicopters, nuke car engines, and dismember Soviet extremists from half a mile away. Or the GM6 Lynx, a shoulder fireable 50 BMG. The rounds from these guns hit with enough force to penetrate 24 inches into the ground, meaning they can be fired whenever the graboid is running close to the surface. The minigun might be a practical weapon if it was mounted to a reinforced base. The minigun averages 50 rounds a second, a single 7.62 
to round. It generates 3,500 joules of force. So in one second, you're hit with 175,000 joules of force. That's equivalent to 130,000 foot-pounds of force, which is the equivalent to 130 feet per pound of your body. There are YouTube videos of people shooting them, but you'll notice it is an extremely short burst and super inaccurate. It would have been far more effective to have the parkour kid lure the worm into a narrow area with hunters on elevated platforms to either side, firing at a 45 degree angle into the worm as it advances. With the minigun mounted from this position, the only means of escape for the graboid would be to dive, which would still expose its body for long enough to do serious damage with big guns. Hell, these guys are rich. If they want to show, they should splurge on a few Cambodian RPGs too. I'm not familiar with the process, but I'm pretty sure you just need to land a drug runner plane nearby, rain some greenbacks, pile in your boomsticks, and then make the jump back to Thailand. Easy. On the mainland, a conservation group led by Dr. Jazz Welker and hungover Napoleon Dynamite tags a herd of Asian elephants. Jazz spots Bill's hunting party heading for the Avex Bio Private Island, 1.2 kilometers offshore. Jazz, Jimmy, and Ishimon shuttle over to the island and discover the carcass of a graboid in the jungle. Giant orange holes suggest something from inside tore its way out. Jazz says that what's left of the carcass is an exoskeleton, and Jimmy tells us it had dorsal convex dermal armor plating. Suddenly, the creatures begin to circle them. A shriek breaks the silence. Jimmy tells everyone to run. Halfway to the boat, Ishii stops, realizing he's surrounded, like a way less cool Billy from the Predator. A bipedal shrieker appears behind him. Ishii twirls his machete, ready to defend himself. When a second shrieker blindsides him, Jimmy tries to grab his arm, but the shrieker drags Ishii away. Ishii's death is just as much Jazz's fault as it is the snobby billionaires who came here to hunt these monsters. Jazz's team has been picking up seismic activity from her camp. She's had encounters with graboids before. She knew Bill was a psycho with a history of hunting big game to impress other rich idiots, and she saw that they were armed to the fucking teeth while approaching this island. If you're going to trespass on someone else's private island in search of illegal poaching or big game hunting, bring weapons and a camera so, you know, you can record evidence of illegal activity, or defend yourself. Better yet, if you think it's Graboids before you even get there, bring a boombox and idle the ship offshore while playing bad pop music until you see the telltale dirt spouts of Graboid moving in the ground. Record that and call the World Wildlife Federation, or Greenpeace, and go full PETA on Bill's ass. Jazz and Jimmy make it back to the mainland. Jazz tells Jimmy he needs to track down Burt Gummer, yes, the OG Graboid slayer from the Nevada desert, and bring him back to handle the situation. Jimmy takes off for a remote island in Papua New Guinea to find him. One false move on the beach, and one of Bert's traps snares Jimmy like a wild boar. Bert appears with a four-pronged pinning spear and cuts Jimmy down. Bert's deep into his castaway roleplay. Jimmy convinces him to help with the graboid problem, warning that there's 800 people and a research team living within the island's kill zone. Back with the hunting party, the Elon Musk wannabes are measuring wallets. One guy bets another that Anna can't hit a bullseye with an arrow from a across the river. She ups the bet and offers to shoot an apple off of his head while looking in a mirror facing the opposite way. The trick's clearly old hat to her, and she nails it in style. Jazz arrives to ruin Bill's day. He admits to flying in four graboids to the island for this rich boy sports hunting extravaganza and reassures her they'll all be dead by the end of the weekend. She corrects him, saying that one of the graboids is already dead. She tells him to call off the hunt or she'll report him to the World Wildlife Federation. He tells her, <laughs> he's jammed the entire area's communication network until the hunt is over. Take that, Karen. At night, a storm sweeps over the island, and a drunken trust funder wearing a scarf in 90 degree weather wanders into the jungle to relieve himself. A spooky noise sends him running into a nearby outhouse, where he's yanked down into the septic tank by a creature. None of them have done even the slightest bit of research before coming on this trip, and that hubris is going to get them all killed. A skilled game hunter learns the ways of his prey in order to kill it, and a skilled leader of big game hunters makes sure his paying customers don't become their prey's lunch. Bill brags repeatedly about manipulating the graboid genome of the eggs he flew into the island, but he never once thought to preemptively inject the worms with an explosive or corrosive tag when they were still small, or edit the genes that trigger the final stage 
stage of their evolution. Graboid biology has been studied for 30 years at this point. You would think these weekend warriors would at least know the general behavior of the species they're stalking. If Bill were smart, he'd see Jazz's interruption as a lucky accident, and at the very least, ply her for information about the Graboids before starting the hunt. As for Jazz, I honestly don't know if she still wants to stop a Graboid invasion of Asia or just let Bill die for his arrogance. She knows at least one Graboid has spawned Shriekers already, and she knows what happens after Shriekers evolve into their final form. But she doesn't tell Bill any of this here. Maybe she assumes he already knows, but that is a bold mistake for a conservationist to make. Even though Bill's base camp is on the mainland away from Shrieker Island, it should still have a security detail walking the perimeter at all times, as well as seismic and thermal detection systems monitoring the surrounding jungle. And this guy pisses in the jungle only to end up taking shelter in an outhouse anyways. If he had been of sound mind and, you know, done any research whatsoever, he might have climbed onto the outhouse roof instead of barricading himself inside. Because this creature pulls him underground, it's most likely a graboid and not a shrieker, meaning the best place to be is off the floor. Once on the roof, he could have screamed for help from the heavily armed men parting only a few meters away, and potentially wouldn't have ended up as graboid shit. Bird arrives in Thailand with his very own mini documentary detailing his extensive history with the graboids. The infomercial sums up the monster's biology with a nifty little cartoon. The graboid lives underground and hunts by sensing seismic activity on the surface. It pulls its prey into its mouth using three eel-like tongues. Its next development stage begins when it spawns three blind bipedal younglings called shriekers that hunt with infrared sensors. For some reason, the video doesn't detail the final and most dangerous stage of the graboid's evolution, which we'll get to in a minute. Just as Bert begins his address to the research team in person, he's interrupted by Bill and Anna. Bert zeroes in on the gun Bill's carrying, a Weatherby 308 with a biometric fingerprint trigger lock. Bert points out that using it on a graboid would be about as effective as spitting at Godzilla. Bill warns Bert to behave himself and leaves. Bert instructs the research team to collect their weaponry. Unfortunately, they don't have any. Jimmy takes them to a World War II bomb shelter to show them what they do have. Knives, steel machetes, and an M2 flamethrower. Oh, and crates of sweating dynamite. Freddy volunteers to use the dynamite to create a perimeter defense against the Graboids, saying it might not kill them, but it'll at least sound the alarm. On the beach, Freddy also brings a bird in a cage to use as an early warning system for danger, as well as the only rifle that they have, which only shoots tranquilizers or tracker darts. Gun measuring contests aside, this is the point in the story where we have to mention the most boring strategy of them all, and that's going for reinforcements. Look, Bert's the crazy uncle we all wish we had, but with no real reliable firepower, taking out three graboids and a bunch of shriekers is gonna be tough, and without plot armor, suicidal. Bill may have cut off communication with their location, but the research team has a boat which they could use to quickly shuttle to the mainland military or police base and warn them about the graboid infestation on the island. Again, people have known about Graboids for 30 years at this point. This isn't like someone wandering into town claiming they saw Bigfoot. He's busy fighting Wendigos in upstate New York. This is a credible threat that a military base would definitely take seriously. As for the paltry weapons that they do have, well, that dynamite is simply the explosive nitroglycerin stabilized by clay. Dynamite has a shelf life of around six months before the nitroglycerin begins to decompose and sweat out into the container holding the dynamite. These bang sticks are 80 years old, so by this point, the dynamite might not explode at all, even if they do explode, blowing them up inside a bunker that Jimmy tells us was designed to withstand nuclear explosions is not gonna kill the queen, it's just gonna scare her off, and waste our only weapons. Ultimately, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here, we're trying to kill a giant man-eating armor-plated worm. Back in Nevada, Bert, Val, and Earl used the pipe bomb technique to kill graboids by dragging dragging lit dynamite along the ground until the graboid swallowed it and then blew up. He should do that here too. It's safer, more dangerous to the worm, and allows them to try again and again with individual sticks of dynamite, rather than blowing their whole load at once. On Shrieker Island, Bill's hunting party hikes for high ground, listening to shrieks in the jungle they want to believe are monkeys. Some of the party are drunk, others out of shape. All are gunning for a mounted graboid skull on their office wall, completely oblivious to the Shrieker 
are stalking them via their built-in thermal vision. Anne is forced to play babysitter for a drunk Wall Street punk who's being stalked by shriekers. At the edge of a clearing, their hike is halted by movement in the brush. Meanwhile, Bert, Freddy, and Jimmy arrive to the carcass of the Graboid. Bert warns them that now that three shriekers have emerged from the body, they'll gorge on protein for two to five days before molting into their final Pokemon flying form, which is called an Ass Blaster. If they can't kill the Graboids and Shriekers before they become airborne, the monsters will leave the island and take over Asia. This is why people die, Bert, because you bury the important part until you're standing on top of a nest of Graboids and Shriekers. The fact that these things metamorphosize into the world's ugliest carnivore butterflies should have been the first thing you mentioned back on the mainland. More importantly, they knew before leaving for this expedition that the Graboids hunt by seismic movement and the Shriekers hunt by infrared tracking. They could have prepared traps for both forms of the Graboids before they ever actually set foot on the island. To kill the Graboids, they could circle the island to look for boulder outcroppings, then rig a sound and movement trap to use the pipe bomb technique to kill them. For the Shriekers, they could build a fire to lure them in with the heat signature before Bert blasts them all with his flamethrower. Better yet, go to Bill's unguarded camp after they left to scavenge for guns they couldn't carry, then pull the boat up along the island's shoreline, waving a flare or giant torch to draw the Shriekers' attention, and then pick them off from the safety of the boat with a sniper shot to the back of their throats. The other way to sneak up on Shriekers would be to look for plastic paneling in the camps that they could hold up in front of themselves as thermal shields. When viewed through thermal imaging, plastic disperses thermal radiation, obscuring the human living form behind it and making it simply look like a giant burning red rectangle, a shape which would likely confuse the creatures long enough to get them focused on something else, or fire off a shot into their soft palate. Back with Bill's hunting party, they don't know about the Graboid's life cycle, or that the Shriekers can hunt via heat signature. They unknown lose a straggler as a shrieker attacks the drunkard without anyone noticing. In a clearing, the party becomes surrounded as the Graboids speak to each other. Anna warns Bill that they've lost a party member, but he's not phased. Suddenly, four shriekers converge on the group. They shriek, causing head-splitting disorientation for the party. The shriekers easily pick off three hunters. Mohawk fights back with his minigun, but the shrieks overpower him too. They're saved at the last second by Bert and his flamethrower. He kills one and scares the other three away, but not not before Freddy darts one with a tracker. It's almost like these posers want to feed themselves to the Graboids. This hunting party has nine members, and none of them notice one of their own getting picked off feet behind them. And they barely bat an eye when they're suddenly surrounded, and the creatures begin to use bioacoustics to communicate with one another. Has no one here watched Jurassic Park? The moment a predator species starts talking, this hunting party should rally its defenses, creating a tight circle with their backs to each other, prepared for an oncoming attack. From this formation, it would have been impossible for the Shriekers to ambush them. It opens their fields of fire and minimizes their chances of shooting one another. Since only one shot needs to hit home in order to kill a shrieker, concentrated fire from three rookies like this should overpower the monsters. And if they had done any research at all, they would have known about the shrieker's heat-seeking vision. They could have brought flares with them to create visual confusion and distract them long enough to mow them down or retreat to a more defensible position. The shrieker's supersonic attack seems to be just one of the mutations caused by Bill's genetic meddling, so there's little that they could have done about that without hearing protection, which they definitely should have been wearing when on a hunt with a guy armed with a minigun. Had they all been wearing Gucci Ear Pro, the Shrieker sonic attack wouldn't have disoriented them, and they'd have been able to return accurate fire. After the Shriekers are gone, Bill warns everyone to stop moving, pointing out that the clearing is the perfect place for Graboids to wait to ambush prey. Bert learns that not only did Bill hatch four Graboids on the island, but that he enhanced enhanced them with stem cells and edited their genome to increase their predatory instincts. Bert throws the flamethrower, and Anna shoots it as the Graboid bears down on it. Chunks of flesh rain down across the killing field as the group races for the boat. That's a second Graboid down with two to go. And there goes one of her best weapons. Even if Bert could throw the flamethrower that far, which he can't, nor can he run for sh** even if Anna could make that shot, which she couldn't. Even if a 9mm bullet could ignite the fuel, which it can't. It's still a terrible idea, because they could have achieved the same exact outcome, or better, with a bundle of dynamite, without sacrificing their flamethrower. Hell, they could have even used the dynamite as percussive bombs to distract the Graboid long enough to make it retreat. Back on the mainland, 
hand, Chaz gives the group bad news. One of their 11,000 pound bull elephants suddenly disappeared. She tracked his GPS tracker to a 19 meter long mass that weighs 20 tons, located 37 meters below the surface. A giant genetically modified graboid that can tunnel through Earth somehow escaped the island and is only 1,000 meters away under Bill's camp. Bert says it's impossible. The graboids can't swim and they aren't big enough to eat elephants. But the data doesn't lie. Bill interrupts and tells them they're returning to finish the hunt, even if he's a few men short. Bert tells him he's in over his head and refuses to get out of his way. So Bill has one of his men shoot him with a tranquilizer dart. This is like that final handshake showdown in Django Unchained, only even dumber. If Bill wants to risk death to continue the hunt, let him. At worst, he reduces the number of beasts we have to fight. At best, he becomes lunch and gets out of our way while we strategize our next move. Wagging a moral finger here doesn't do anybody any good. Bert's only lucky Bill hit him with a trank instead of a good old-fashioned bullet. The strategy here is, don't anger the idiot glamping hunters. Wait till they leave and then fix the radio to call for military support or send someone off in the boat to the nearest base with firebombing and bunker-busting equipment. After nightfall, Bill's camp is on high alert. A noise in the jungle sparks an all-out war zone shootout. Heavy caliber machine gun shells rain down over the camp. Unfortunately, the hunters aim with about as much accuracy as a blind drunk man trying to take a leak. Something grabs one of the hunters and yanks him out of sight. Another hunter named Doc tries to make a break for it as Anna fires two flares into the sky to give them some visibility. Doc trips and comes face to face with the behemoth graboid. The hunters are awestruck until they realize the giant is essentially using its tail as a lure while the rest of it moves in from behind and devours Doc Hole. Anna tells Bill they have to stop the hunt, but he refuses, so she resigns and runs off into the night. Meanwhile, Bert and the rest of the research group are tied up with zip ties in the bunker. Bert tells them they'll need a knife to cut through the ties. Jimmy tells Bert that the shoes he borrowed have 550 paracord instead of shoelaces, which he can use as a friction saw. Bert doesn't need to be told twice. He saws through the zip ties on his wrist, then helps the others. Unfortunately, they realize the bunker has been locked from the outside. Suddenly, there's a noise and the door opens. Anna has arrived to let them out and offer her help to stop the queen graboid. Something big rams the bunker. Anna accidentally led the queen right to them. The group devises a trap for the queen. They gather the remaining dynamite into bundles and lay them out in the bunker. Anna turns on the generator, flooding the space with noise. The queen graboid begins ramming the bunker. Bert talks is a lit stick of dynamite and the group races outside as the rest of the stash explodes. It's a great convenience that Jimmy learned from the best and replaced his shoelaces with paracord that they can use to cut through zip ties. If you're not walking around with paracord on your shoes, the easiest way to break zip ties is by using a method I've shown you before on how to get out of duct tape. As counterintuitive as it may sound, when you're bound at the wrist with zip ties, you want to tighten them as tightly around your wrist as possible. Use your teeth to make it so tight your wrists are practically laying against one another. Then, in one quick sweeping motion, lift your arms high above your head, then yank your arms down past your stomach, almost like you're trying to touch elbows behind your back. This should break the zip ties. You guys should be experts at this by now. While blowing up the bunker looks cool, it's a massive overkill and a huge waste of the remaining supplies. Jimmy says this bunker was built to withstand nuclear explosions, but he also says it was built for the fighting in World War II. Since nuclear weapons weren't built until the end of the war, I'd say Jimmy doesn't know what he's talking about. Even if it wouldn't withstand a nuclear explosion, it would likely contain the explosion from a few sticks of dynamite. The energy would likely escape through the easiest route, which is the door, with damage contained to the bunker interior and nothing done to the worm outside. All this is a massive sound attack to drive the worm away. Instead, they should rig a single crate of explosives with a long fuse by the open front door and fish for graboid tentacles by banging on the ground with a stick until a tentacle pops up and grabs the crate. Then, we could simply light the fuse and wait for the nitro still left in the dynamite, or the nitro that's seeped into the crate to ignite. The other option would be to let the graboids break through the bunker wall, much like the worm did to Bert's basement wall all those years ago. In that position, the worm would likely be stuck and struggle to maneuver backward into the ground where it can move freely. At that point, everyone could move outside and a pipe bomb could be thrown into its open mouth. The next morning, Bill's last remaining hunter, Mr. Bowtie, wants to call it a day, but Bill's too pot committed and insane to stop things now. He tells the hunter to meet him by the riverbank. Back 
match with Bert, they're rigging their defensive line of additional dynamite. When Freddy tells him the GPS on the Queen Graboid says it returned to Bill's camp, Bert races over to find the last hunter being dragged into the river by the Queen, while Bill peppers its armor-plated hide with small caliber bullets. Bert tries to talk sense into Bill, but he's too far gone. He fires wildly into the water, telling the Queen exactly where he is. She reaches one wily tentacle through the bridge from below and easily claims his 200 pounds of flesh. Petty Bowtie isn't a real survivalist. He might actually have stood a chance of surviving this attack by pulling a secondary weapon and firing or slicing into the Graboid's sensitive mouth area. Pity still that he's got Crazy Bill doing jack all to help him. Bill should know his shots to the armor-plated exoskeleton of this beast aren't doing anything. With the Graboid distracted, he should be standing up the slope in front of Bowtie firing shots into the beast's mouth. Bill may just be too far gone at this point though. But let's not forget about Bert. There's no way he should have shown up empty-handed to this melee fight. He might not have a gun, but he still has some dynamite, machetes, and enough flammable gas to make another flamethrower later. Once Bill is dead, he should return to Bill's camp and gather every discarded weapon he can find before heading back to the research group. Bert returns to his team and hatches a plan. They need to kill the Queen and kill the Shriekers on the island before they molt into flyers. The group splits, and Bert and Jimmy head back to the Shrieker Island to kill the swarm. Their GPS tracker leads them to a series of cool underground caves. Armed with a MacGyvered new flamethrower and a chainsaw, they mud up in a puddle and put on ear protection as a growl echoes through the caverns. The Shriekers attack. Bert machetes one easily. Jimmy swings his chainsaw at another, but a Shrieker pins him. With a Shrieker's weird tongue literally against his cheek, he grabs for the chainsaw and cuts into its belly, freeing himself. They turn a corner and see five more stalking them in the darkness. Bert lights them up with his flamethrower, frying them into crispy critters. When his flamethrower runs out of juice, he ends a barbecued straggler with a dagger to the heart. Jimmy is cornered by the last shrieker and lunges into the beast's mouth with the chainsaw, chewing him up from the inside. Covering ourselves in mud is a good idea to help camouflage us from the Shrieker's infrared vision, but it's only going to be effective if we actually coat ourselves in thick mud, rather than rubbing loose liquid mud on a few exposed areas of our skin, though this wouldn't ultimately cover up the heat given off by our breath. The flamethrower is a great weapon for this cave fight, but it could be used more effectively with less risk to ourselves. If this were a completely sealed cave with only a single opening, their best bet here would be to approach the entrance to to the cave with their flamethrower and shoot short flame bursts into the cave's mouth, sucking out all of the oxygen and either driving the shriekers out directly into the flame's path trying to escape or suffocated them outright. That was one of the primary uses for flamethrowers during the World Wars. Because this cave has an opening, that may not work. Instead, I would set a fire at the cave opening, leading out onto the island, before circling back to this water entry landing. With the exit cut off, you could then yell or shout to draw the shriekers to you and fire the flamethrower upon approach. Also removing oxygen from the higher platforms of the cave while you still have an easy getaway in the boat. The other option would have been to bring a third person, carrying weapons they stole from Bill's camp. With Bert up front wielding the flamethrower, the other two could have guarded his back. Back at the research camp, the team quietly waits for the Queen to trip the dynamite perimeter fence. She makes her explosive entrance, driving them all off the ground into platforms in the trees. Bert and Jimmy arrive. Freddy warns them that they've stepped right on top of the Queen. Bert tells the others to run for a nearby volcano caldera, where they've laid their next trap while he stays behind as a distraction for her. When they're gone, Bert walks calmly towards a nearby horse as the queen breaks ground nearby, triggering dynamite as she goes. Bert rides to the ridge over the caldera, leading the queen. There, the rest of the team has rigged a massive punji pit lined with dynamite. Jimmy's there waiting for Bert when he arrives. He tells Jimmy they need the queen to charge them hard and fast so that she bursts through the cliff and falls to her death on the spears below. The big girl growls upon approach. Bert and Jimmy step forward. Bert pounds the ground with his boot, triggering her to charge. At the last second, Bert shoves Jimmy to safety and flips the queen the bird as she swallows him and plunges over the cliff onto the spikes. Freddy lights her up with dynamite and they all celebrate as her flesh rains down around them. While this finale gets the job done and kills the queen, Bert's death was an unnecessary flourish to end the series. In the Nevada desert, they used a drop fall to kill the last Graboid because they had no equipment or weapons to get the job done otherwise. Here, they have all the equipment they never took from Bill's camp, as well as dynamite to get the job done without sacrificing anyone's life. Bill and Jimmy should have burst in opposite directions to reach high ground when Freddy alerted them to the queen's presence under their feet. From above, it should have been relatively simple 
Apple to arrange another dynamite swallowing trick. Even if the queen is ultimately big enough to knock down trees and water towers, she only does that reactively when the dynamite triggers her to strike the structure with enough force to tear it down. Safely off the ground, the group should have been able to trick her into eating a tasty nitroglycerin treat with a very long fuse, thereby saving everybody's life. Or, if they really want to go for this off-the-cliff trick, why not tether one of the horses to the edge of the cliff instead? Its clomping and screaming would have easily drawn the beast in. Or maybe don't walk towards the beast you're trying to lure up the slope. Just stomp your feet from the edge, giving you plenty of time to dive out of the way without sacrificing yourself. Rich idiots are going to do rich idiot things, so preventing the graboids from ending up on the island altogether is taking things a step too far for these strategies. It is very likely, however, that if Jazz had simply left the hunters alone and gone to the mainland to warn the military, the only victims of the graboids would have been Ishi. To those of you who say they only had a few days to stop the ass blasters from taking over Asia, I would remind you that Jimmy had to fly all the way to a remote castaway island in Papua New Guinea, 3,300 miles away to get Bert in the first place. Literally, the whole country of Thailand and three American military bases are closer to this island than Bert is. Bill and his bumbling band of poorly equipped billionaires were basically cannon fodder. Their training was weak, their aim was atrocious, and I award all of them, including Bill, a survivor score of 1 out of 5. These guys are the stormtroopers of monster hunters. Anna had enough sense to jump ship when she could, but even then, she came to fight Godzilla with a bow and arrow and a 9mm handgun, so she gets a survival score of 1 out of 5 too. Once Bird arrives, using the dynamite effectively would have solved most, if not all of the research team's problems without any casualties on their side, but only if Bert properly debriefed them on the Graboid's abilities before visiting the island. Jazz had zero understanding of her own mortality, going to confront Bill instead of finding actual help. She survives basically because the Queen Graboid isn't hungry enough to eat her, because the Shriekers got to Ishii first. She also gets a survivor score of 1 out of 5. Jimmy is at least smart enough to take Bert's experience with the Graboid seriously, so he gets a survivor score of 2 out of 5. Of the rest of the crew, Freddy's the only standout, with her hard knock backstory and the ability to rig explosive tripwires and actually hit her mark when she fires a gun. We'll give her a survivor score of 3 out of 5. As for Bert, well, his symbolic sacrifice is admirable, but ultimately ultimately unnecessary. He held his own until the end, but if he'd have been more resourceful about scavenging Bill's weapons and using tried and true methods like the pipe bomb swallowing strategy, he would still be alive. I award him a survivor score of 3.5 out of 5. Ultimately, I think the Shriekers from Tremors Shrieker Island were beaten. How would you have beaten Tremors? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to save a stranger's life. Hit the subscribe button to save your own. Thanks for watching, and remember, ignore the expert with 30 years of experience at your own risk. Thank you.